Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. No. Um. <laughs> Morgan John Fox, it is a pleasure to talk to you about the hobby. Uh, you know, I never got into card collecting, and I know people that have, but you know, like Logan Paul is mentioned in the film and spending a million dollars on a rare Pokemon card, and then Patrick Bet David, who's become a mega influencer as well, that built his name up in insurance, has you know been a, a card collector. What is it about this hobby that attracts so many people? I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a passion based hobby, you know, that, I mean, like any hobby, uh, it's n nostalgia, the nostalgia aspect of things. I think that, you know, in a world where things are becoming more and more online, people still desire to like, uh, attach themselves, these tactile things that give them a sense of history. And especially if they collected, you know, most of these people, uh, do that you know logan paul collected pokemon as a kid so like there are there are reasons that people gravitate to these things that gave them a sense of history and meaning as when they were younger um and continue to go to those things as they evolve through time especially when they have more money because as a kid often you don't have the money to get the coolest thing that you wanted in that space and then suddenly when you have the money you're like wait a minute now i can buy the best version of that thing that i wanted so bad back then uh, so I think that's why a lot of people get into it, especially that, uh, you know, influencers with a lot of money or whatever suddenly realize they can spend their money on ridiculous things uh, that uh, they wouldn't have considered before. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, I think like any hobby, whether it's, you know, record collecting or collecting shoes or comics, uh, you know, if you had that gene, that collector gene. The, the the wild thing about card collecting is that it kind of represents everything now. You know, people will just call them baseball cards or whatever. But there's so many different types of, you know, there's cards of movies. There's obviously TCGs like Pokemon and Magic the Gathering. You know, there's Marvel cards, there's Star Wars cards, Star Wars cards. Every sport imaginable, tennis, baseball, basketball, hockey, F1. Like every everything that you can imagine now, there's a card for. Which some people think is ridiculous. But, but the truth is, if you're a collector, it's kind of like the dream time to be involved in that world. Right. Um, I'm not you know, making fun of it by a, any means. I just never got into it because oh, no, you know, no. they're so small, I'd lose them. I'll, I, I'll make fun of it. I mean, it's it's something that should be made fun of. I Even though I am a collector, you know, it's. I think any hobby can be made fun of. Like you should be able to make fun of the thing that you're involved in. You know, it's it's collecting pieces of cardboard. So at the end of the day, so, but it's fun. The, the one I don't fully understand at all is the digital cards that people are starting to collect. And I'm like, there's no tangible. It's on my phone. If my screen cracks, what happens? If the company goes out of business, what happens? Like, we see that with movies. Like, I know people that bought a bunch of digital films that sat there and, you know, 10 of them have been erased because they're like, ah, we're not carrying it anymore. So, like, what does that do to a market like this? Yeah. Uh, I will say, I think a lot of that is like speculative investing more so than the, the passionate collectors, you know, um, uh, I agree. I mean, it's like NFTs, you know, like some people who have some NFTs, maybe in 10, 15 years, people will be like, damn, I should have got in. Other people have already gone to zero with those things. Like, you know, uh, I think it's just a question of like, how long does that continue to evolve? And if so, then will these the ones that have been released at the early forefront suddenly be looked at as the like the Babe Ruths and Mickey Mantles, the old school like original. Will that ever be the thing? I don't know. So I'm guessing some people are just hedging their bets on that, like uh, hoping that maybe one day those things are considered the you know the the Grails, the early stuff. But uh, I don't, I don't personally. I think I bought one pack one day because I got a free credit, but that's about it. <laughs> I, I definitely don't see that that uh, appeal. So let's put this this to you, since you're a collector yourself. You know, I collect things as well. Um, what is your most valuable card, if you're willing to share that? And what's your most sentimental one that, like, people are like, really, that's the one you kept? Like, some some guy that played six games in Major League Baseball, and that's whose card you have? Yeah, uh, my most valuable card is actually behind me here. It's a... Hank Aaron, a 1956 Hank Aaron 
card in a very high grade. You know, they grade cards these days, like they grade comics or coins where they sh- say between one and 10, how valuable, uh, you know, how and in what condition is it? Uh, so it's a high grade Hank Aaron card. Uh, it's still only worth like $1,500, like in comparison to some of the things you might see in the documentary where cards are selling for millions. Uh, I just don't like, uh, you know, I, I don't want to put, t- I'd rather invest in terms of investing, I'd rather keep those things in safe, safer spaces. Uh, some would card world is the safest. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that and like a uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar rookie card I also have over there that's uh, autographed. Uh, but in terms of like sentimental stuff, I had weird, uh, I have actually some in front of me. I have like uh, a couple I can show you. I have one that's just a, literally a Shaquille O'Neal. This is like, I got this, I pulled this from a pack when I was young. The Shaquille O'Neal rookie card in perfect condition. I somehow kept it in a perfect tin condition, even though I didn't get it put into a case and graded until like two years ago. Uh, and then I have weird stuff like uh, Gremlins, movie fan Gremlins. I love the Gremlins. This is autographed by the director of Joe Dante. Like to me, that's just really cool. Worth maybe a hundred dollars max, but I love it. So you know, I don't know. I have I have a mix, and I don't put tons of money into cards. Probably a little more money than I should. But uh, to me, it's just the uh, I had the collector's gene, uh, and so it's just fun to have them. All right. So then, this is the question for non-collectors: When does it go from collecting to hoarding? That's a great question. I think that uh, I don't know the technical definition for hoarding, but I would say that if you if you no longer know what you have. Um, and or if it's in the way of your footpath. <laughs> if your nightstand and, and the path between your bed and your bathroom, uh, you have to step over the things, then you should probably chill. Uh, but beyond that, you know, like these things are worth money. So theoretically, uh, you know, if you can turn them around and uh, or, or someone else can turn them around in your absence and 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 uh and get money exchange for them then i think it's safe to say that it's still collecting but don't don't stack them up in a way of, of where you should be walking in your house i guess i get it no and like you know there's the mcdonald's cards that were ever released and the toys and things of that sort so you know i i collect as well what was the catalyst to want to make you do a documentary about your own hobby because you know documentaries aren't necessarily known to be big money making blockbusters and, you know, is it your way of like, hey, I could write this off to go buy more cards? Like, how does this work for you? <laughs> um, I the, uh, So XCR, the production company, already had this project set up. Uh, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and, and be knowledgeable about this world. And so I was able to, I literally was walked into a meeting where they were discussing needing a director for this documentary. So it was the past, I come from an indie filmmaking world where I was writing, directing and, and securing financing for my feature films um, and documentaries. And um, this was not the case. This was a project that was already set up for a really cool company out in LA. And I just, it's sort of a dream if you're into some like, uh, weird niche world, some nerdy niche world, and then a company is like, "Hey, we need a director," uh, and uh, you know, I got a job directing something that I really enjoy, and never imagined that that would be a possibility. So, uh, I kind of stumbled into it and felt really lucky that I did. Well, hey, look who you're talking to. You're talking to a guy that runs Fanboy Nation. So, <laughs> all right. So I have to m- mention this because we don't want to give too much of the documentary away. We want people to watch it on February 16th when it's released, but to and i'm gonna get this uh, in a roundabout way to get to get to my point or to get to my real question sure. uh geraldo rivera worked for a news network with your surname and someone had brought uh-huh. in a ticket from the original woodstock that had never been cashed in so like it still had the little flap that they tore off and geraldo accidentally <laughs> tore the stub off and it lost all its value has there, was <laughs> no. there so yeah it was by complete accident and you know there was a rumor that stan lee did that with uh fantastic four number one accidentally pulled this the cover off the original one that he was signing and some guy lost his mind and he's like it was only worth 10 cents 
forgetting like how much the comic was worth in that in you know when uh, in that era whatever year it was was there something that you saw in this documentary where somebody had or you were making you know when you were making the documentary that was a card of value that they accidentally sat on or stepped on or you know lost for a ridiculous reason that was so minute that you're like well there went the value of that thing um uh, I think the coolest story that I heard that was similar enough to that is that Pops, uh, the uh, production, the card producing company um, that manufactured, they in the 1950s, uh, 1952, 1953, um, there was uh, a lot going on in the world and they had printed more cards than they could sell. And they needed to uh, start producing new cards for each year. And so they had this backlog of inventory of 1952 Tops cards. And they loaded up cases of those cards on a barge and dumped them into the ocean. And uh, a single case, one single case of those cards today would sell for $15 million. Um, and they just dumped them. They dumped them all in the water. And, uh, you know, so I when I, I remember hearing that story. And, you know, it, it's a two-edged sword. Because on one hand, the fact that they dumped them all into the ocean is makes them more scarce today. Mm -hmm. But on the, just a couple of those were still around. That's a lot of money. A single case of cards. And they probably dumped hundreds, if not more, cases of those into the water. It all makes me, makes me wonder, are they worth more now that they're waterlogged because of the backstory of having been dumped? That's that's the point, right? So, like, there's only so many of these cards in the specific condition that they're in because now, you know, everything is graded and it's all about the condition. Um, you know, in a perfect condition of that card, there's only three that exist uh, of the Mickey Mantle rookie card from that set. Um, and, you know, one, they're... One that's not even perfect, that's just below perfect, sold for $12.6 million, a single piece of cardboard. But part of that is the scarcity. There's only so many of those in those conditions that exist. And, you know, yeah, if more had uh, survived, then they wouldn't be worth as much money because it's about supply and demand. There's only so many people that are going to shell out that, um, that crazy amount of money for a little piece of cardboard. So, yeah, I think that's interesting, right? So every time somebody actually rips and breaks something, it theoretically makes whatever has survived more valuable. Is there, how do I put this? Um, when you sit there and start doing the grading and you start doing the casing and you start doing all these other things to protect the investment, you know, uh, does it almost devalue, not devalue the item, but like take away from the desire to collect just to collect now that there's more of a focus on everything? I think that that's part of the debate that we focus in the film, like true collectors versus, uh, you know, investors or, or companies that are just looking after their bottom line, perhaps. Uh, you know, I think this, in the film world, this is attributable to, you know, giant studio versus filmmakers. You know, people are in the versus people are in this for money and the bottom line. Uh, you know, yes, grading something, you know, the idea that uh, uh, cards, for example, in perfect condition are worth a ton of money. Like the first edition Charizard is can fetch $200,000 or more in perfect condition. But if it's in perfect condition, that means that a kid did not play with it and actually play the game and trade it with their, their friends. Uh, and the fact that people who are aware of that condition would tell their children who maybe collect Pokemon cards today that they shouldn't touch the cards, that they need to keep them completely protected, which means they're not going to play them and do the thing that Pokemon actually exists for, which is it is a trading card game. Uh, yeah, I mean, th that is a healthy debate to have in a world where become valuable and uh, monetizable is that uh, what is the actual purpose of these things? Um, you know, if it's only about money and condition, then the joy of having them and holding them, uh, will, and, and certainly yeah, it makes harder for the hardcore collectors to get these things if they're, if, if people that are best getting in that create a, uh, you know, supply and demand issue and hike the prices up. So definitely a debate. Right. 
And, you know, because that's something that I worry about. Like, if I just want to collect, like the, you said, the Pokemon cards or the Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and we just want to play versus, oh, no, this one's going to be worth, you know, $15,000 three weeks from now. Like, where's the enjoyment in that aspect of the game? It's a great point. I mean, that's the characters in the documentary. Super Duper Danny lives out in L.A., and they are a Pokemon uh, YouTuber uh, who also opens cards on their streams, um, you know, opens boxes of cards. People buy into what they call box breaks. Um, and uh, Danny has been making YouTube videos on Pokemon since they were 13 years old. And so they can look back at them opening packs of cards that are now worth twenty, thirty thousand dollars um, and look back at them opening the cards and sort of like banging them on the table when they open them to like organize them, stuff that you would never do now because it's like considered crazy because of you want to protect the condition. Uh, but they can look back at that history and see how carefree they were and being like just cool that they got a card and see their reaction and how genuine and pure it was versus now – Still super excited about the cards. Danny still loves the cards and is in that world uh, full time, but but is conscious of of making sure those cards aren't damaged and that kind of thing. So uh, you know, I think that that's why we included that conversation in the documentary um, because that you know there's constantly online people sort of getting at each other's throats about you know we want to gatekeep uh, sometimes for the best reasons, some for not great reasons. Uh, but I think it is it's something that's worth exploring always. Like we're never a hobby, a passion hobby uh, has folks who are just worried about money getting involved in it. It's can, it can ruin it, but sometimes like maybe there's a way where those things can work together. Maybe it just so happens that you have this collection, like in Danny's that is worth a lot of money and it's not why they got into it, but, but now they have this thing that one day can be a little bit of a retirement portfolio, which is also pretty damn cool. Morgan, I'm going to leave you with this because the documentary The Hobby comes out on February 16th and it's a lot of fun and it's an enjoyable documentary. It's not like this murder mystery, you know, someone got killed for a Yu-Gi-Oh card. <laughs> that you're like, oh my God, what happened? You know, it's not it's not like the next 48 or whatever that show is called. Uh, besides the Mickey Mantle card, you know, besides that one, what is Morgan John Fox's Holy Grail card? Oh, ooh, I don't know. That's a good, I don't really have a, like a card that if I could have in my possession tomorrow right? Um, that I don't have. Um, I mean, maybe there's these rare, like Harry Potter, for example, they had the, like, they put out cards that were like autographed by the entire cast, like the lead cast that are worth tons of money. I would never buy one personally thousand dollars or something for one of those cards uh you know that would be cool to have it's just like a piece of like pop culture history that there's only so many of those that exist um but i feel like i already have a lot of the ones like i mean that gremlins card that i was showing you like i i truly like that's something that not a lot of people care about that i really care about and would never sell but like uh, i don't know i i uh yeah, I guess I don't really have one, and it's certainly not just, like, the most valuable cards, because that's not truly what I care about. You know, yeah, like, I was thinking, like, what would be the one that, like, make you take down your wedding photo and put on the mantle? <laughs> wow. Oh, I wouldn't. That is my real answer to that. I think that's the right answer to that question. Right. Um, but I don't I don't know. You know, one card I don't have to really do want is there's a Luke Skywalker, George Lucas card from the original 1977 Star Wars set. And it's George Lucas directing uh, uh, Luke Skywalker, uh, you know, uh, on set. You know, it's, it's their main George Lucas card, but that's like the main. So having one of those in perfect condition would be cool just because I'm a film geek. Uh, but, but I'm not going to take them in my photo. I don't, I'm not that crazy about collecting. <laughs> Morgan John Fox, it's been a great pleasure chatting with you. Remind everybody where we can find you on social media and you know where we can find the film. Yeah, thank you. It's been great chatting with you as well. Yeah, this Friday, February 16th, anywhere that you can stream, you know, download or rent movies. So Apple, Amazon, Google Play, 
all of these uh, outlets for those uh, on-demand video. Uh, check it out. It'll be available. Share it with friends. Have watch parties. Uh, you know, talk about it online, even if you don't like it. The discourse, you know, a little healthy discourse is always nice. Uh, you know, and I appreciate you helping spread spread the word on Fanboy Nation. Uh, taking some time out of your day. Um, you know, it's it's fun being able to talk about cards and share this documentary. Listen, Took a lot of time to make, and uh, I'm proud of it. You get to talk about cards. I get to talk about movies. It's a win-win for both of us. You know, oh, and the social media, where can we find you? Yeah, I'm Morgan John Fox um, on all social media. No H and John, just J-O-N. Uh, pretty much anywhere on all social media. Awesome. Morgan John Fox, thank you so much for your time. Again, The Hobby releases on February 16th. Congratulations on enjoying your hobby and making a documentary about it.